So my name is Jeff Smith, and I have the pleasure of serving as the chairman of the Parents and in Science Initiative. And it's a real pleasure to welcome you this evening to our winter uh, Parents and Science Evening Program. This is the second of three events that Rockefeller University will host, especially for parents, during this academic year. The university introduced the Parents and Science Lecture Series in 2007 as a resource for parents interested in gaining new insights into child and adolescent development. Parents and Science sponsors events that bring both the university's distinguished scientists uh, to the podium together with outside experts from fields such as psychology, medicine, education, and the social sciences. We hope that by participating in these lectures, you will have the opportunity to meet leading scientists and learn about biomedical breakthroughs, uh, and particularly breakthroughs that are improving the health and well-being of our children, and also to engage in a dialogue with other parents who are interested in science and, and, and issues of biomedical uh, science and, and development. Um, we are, really have been very pleased with the enthusiastic response that the lecture series has uh, engendered in the community. Tonight, more than 220 people RSVP'd, and we really appreciate all of you uh, coming to join us. Um, during the past two years, as, as this program has developed, many people have uh, come up and conveyed their appreciation to Rockefeller for sponsoring these programs and expressed an interest in supporting the university. And so in order to create a way uh, for people to do that, I'm pleased to announce that this year Rockefeller has launched the Parents and Science Discovery Fund. Um, and the fund has a dual purpose. The first is to support the innovative research that goes on here at Rockefeller, research that often has potential to benefit our children in their lifetimes. Um, and we're doing this particularly through the creation of a Parents and Science graduate and postdoctoral set of fellowships. Secondarily, the fund will provide vital support for the university's educational outreach initiatives, which are actually quite substantial and include a student-focused holiday lecture series, uh, participation by a number of Rockefeller faculty in a program called Students Modeling a Research Topic, and a very robust summer research program that focuses both on high school students as well as high school teachers in the sciences. Uh, and I'm particularly pleased that the fund is now reaching almost $200,000. And uh, we would welcome your uh, support and participation if this is something that is of interest to you. And if you'd like more information on the fund, please visit uh, the Parents and Science website, the address of which is listed in the back of your programs. Uh, before I turn the podium over to President Paul Nurse, I have the honor of uh, telling you a little bit more about Paul. Uh, Paul has a very long list of awards, uh, too long to go into everyone in detail, but there are few that certainly uh, merit recognition. In 1998, Paul was awarded the Lasker Award for Basic Medical Research. The Lasker is often referred to as the American Nobel Prize. In 1999, Paul received a knighthood for his contributions to cancer research and cell biology. And in 2001, he shared the actual Nobel Prize in Medicine for research that shed light on cellular mechanisms involved in cancer. Since moving to the university in 2003, Paul has become one of the nation's most prominent public voices in science. And when he actually first arrived on campus, Paul publicly stated that he wanted to make outreach and education a top priority. And based on the numerous publications, both uh, scientific as well as uh, the lay press, that reach out to him to comment on important issues in science, based on his uh, role with Charlie Rose and hosting a series of shows about science and health-related topics, and of course, for tonight's audience, most importantly, his strong support for the Parents and in Science Initiative, he has uh, certainly taken a very strong public uh, stance on science here in the United States. So it's with great pleasure I turn the podium over to Paul Nurse. Well, thank you, Jeff, for those um, very kind remarks. Thank you for that. And I want to join Jeff in welcoming all of you to the campus this evening. And we are especially honored this evening because uh, Michelle uh, Patterson, the First Lady of New York State, is here with us tonight. So Mrs. Mrs. Patterson, we're delighted that you could join us. <laughs> well, we hope that tonight's program will better acquaint you with this rather remarkable institution, Rockefeller University, which was the first of its kind in the United States when it was founded in 1901, dedicated 
to biomedical research. And since that time, over 100 years, uh, Rockefeller has made essential contributions to biomedicine that have been recognized the entire world over. Amongst them are the discovery that DNA is the basic material of heredity. Some would argue the most important biomedical discovery of the 20th century. Another discovery, the understanding that cancer can be caused by a virus. More recently, the discovery of leptin, I'm sure familiar to many of you, a key weight regulating hormone. This was discovered here on this campus only 15 years ago. Although we are very small, we have less than 70 faculty, 70 laboratories here. 23 scientists during the lifetime of Rockefeller um, associated with this university have won the Nobel Prize. That is an absolutely extraordinary number. Four of these Nobel laureates received the honor in the past decade. But we have other metrics of the university's excellence. Last fall, President Obama awarded the National Medal of Science to Dr. Elaine Fuchs and our faculty, becoming the 14th university investigator to accept this high honor. You just heard about the Lasker Award. 20 Rockefeller scientists have received this award, as you've heard, often known as the American Nobel. And perhaps just as important in measuring the depth of excellence of our faculty, nearly three quarters of our current tenured faculty are members of the National Academy of Sciences, which is the highest honor that most scientists can expect to um, earn um, in the United States. Now, we have a very interesting program this evening entitled The Biology of Substance Abuse, What Parents of Teens Need to Know. And I just want to spend a, a minute or two to provide a bit of context to this interesting topic. According to um, recent statistics released by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, marijuana use is significantly lower than it was 15 years ago. But despite that, still, nearly 12% of eighth graders still reportedly use marijuana last year. The same report notes that seven of the top 10 drugs abused by 12th graders were either prescribed or purchased over the counter. This includes the non-medical use of painkillers, of cough syrups, of sedatives, as well as stimulants such as Adderall. In September 2009, the New York Times reported a new wave of heroin use amongst young people in the New York area. This is a really important topic. It touches all of our lives. Well, a few of the questions we're likely to deal with this evening include why do some young people use drugs whilst others do not? Why do some become dependent whilst others do not? How do other conditions such as chronic stress and depression affect drug use? To what extent do our genes, our genetic makeup, play a role in determining vulnerability to addiction? And what effects do drugs and alcohol have on the still developing teenage brain? Now to deal with these and other questions, and we're going to ask um, later on this evening for questions from the audience, so I want you to get your brains tuned up to think of the appropriate questions. Um, for this program, we have, and um, we could not have, in fact, two better guides than our two featured scientists, both members of our um, faculty, Professors Mary Jean Creek and Bruce McEwen. And the program will begin with a, an interview-style conversation with Drs. Creek and McEwen. I will carry that out. And after that, um, I will invite you to participate in a question-and-answer question, uh, session. But before doing that, I want to say a few words about Drs. Creek and McEwen. Dr. Mary Jean Creek became, came to Rockefeller in 1964. Quite a long time ago, actually, Mary Jean. She is the university's Patrick and Beatrice Haggerty Professor and head of our Laboratory of the Biology of Addictive Diseases. She's also scientific director of a major research center here, funded by the National Institute on Drug Addiction, which is part of NIH. Dr. Creek began her career as a physician scientist, a very important character uh, type of scientist that we um, try to encourage here at this university, studying heroin addiction at a time when addiction was considered a sign of flawed character 
rather than a disease with significant biological causes. Mary Jean has been instrumental in making addiction research an important branch of biomedical science. Today, she studies the ways in which genes can interact with other factors to raise the risk of opiate addiction, cocaine dependence, and alcoholism. And she and her colleagues also study connections between addiction and conditions such as uh, depression and anxiety. Dr. Bruce McEwen, a graduate here, one of the thousand graduates of Rockefeller University's PhD program, is the university's Alfred Mursky Professor and head of the Harold and Margaret Millikan Hatch Laboratory of Neuroendocrinology. She is, he has been elected to the National Academy of Sciences and its Institute of Medicine and is a member of the National Council on the Developing Child. He was also author of the 2002 book, The End of Stress as We Know It. Bruce's research has helped create a new understanding of how the brain changes in structure and function um, during development in childhood and in adult life. And his work has shown that hormones have lasting effects on the brain and body, helping to explain variations in stress response, as well as the consequences of stress during childhood. Now, I want to ask Mary Jean and Bruce to join me on the stage so we can begin our program. Well, welcome. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. This one's Mary Jean, this one's Bruce. <laughs> Just in case there was any confusion about that. Um, I think I want to start with a, a very general question, and um, either of you can take it. In fact, either of you can take any question I throw at you. Um, teens often experiment with drugs. How likely are they to become addicted? Maybe I should start with that one. I think the good news is if your child or grandchild or friend should try to use a drug once, there's actually, unfortunately, a very low likelihood that they will become addicted. About one in eight to one in 15, however, will, once they use cocaine or alcohol, develop a problem with either addiction or severe abuse. And from my way of looking at not being a gambler, I find that too high for my comfort status. About one in four, even down to one in three, who ever self-administer the short-acting opiate heroin will develop heroin addiction. That is extraordinarily high. The most common to go on to what is defined as dependency or addiction would be nicotine use and even a slightly higher percentage who self-administer nicotine, maybe one in three, will go on to become dependent. Yet, those data are less robust because we know many people developed habituation with nicotine and then backed off from it. So, the good news is just because somebody experiments, they do not necessarily become addicted. And you could ask me, does the brain change? Yes, transiently, permanently, no. On the other hand, we would rather not have such experimentation with illicit drugs or with nicotine. And alcohol will come a special case, we'll discuss later. It can be good for some people, or maybe many people, but... <laughs> But having said that, it is almost alone. There's some tiny exceptions that a drug of abuse, like a cannabinoid, marijuana, may help some people medically, or that nicotine could help some people medically, but it's a swatch, a tiny swatch of people. So I think the only drug that I've mentioned that you would be comfortable with experimenting with, and not at the age it's happening, would be alcohol and all the rest, you just as soon there'd be no experimentation. So if we had plexiglass cages that we could keep everyone in until their brain fully develops, which isn't until about age 21 to 25, that's scary too, then we would probably put them in there, but then we would have a really stressed, anxious creature. So we don't want to do that. Education, prevention, and other efforts is what must prevail. 
Mary Jean, you, in, in your answer, you mentioned um, addiction. I think yes. you were thinking of chemical addiction. You also mentioned dependency. Yes. Could you help us, help uh, me at least, by making clarification what you mean I by the difference? I should ask how many psychiatrists are in the audience. Well, I hope DSM-5 will change the diagnostic categorizations. Dependency has been used so as not to offend. Dependency is an absurd word because there's 100% of development of dependency to many medications, including opiates as used in chronic pain management, including most types of sleeping medication, and many types of antidepressants and anxiolytics, medications to reduce or prevent anxiety. So dependence is a biochemical, physiological, if you will, gene expression series of events that is predictable with certain kinds of medications. Addiction is correctly defined as compulsive drug seeking, drug taking, drug self-administration, despite knowledge of negative consequences to self and others. And that is why when we look for treatments for addiction, we look for medications that have long-acting properties that do not have any high resulting from their use that allow steady state to be achieved. I think the next question may be more for Bruce. Um, what do you think about the issue that some people who may be using drugs are, are really self-medicating for depression and anxiety? I think <clears throat> there's, pro there's a lot to that. I think that we have to think also about the uh, developmental history of somebody. Uh, we know that uh, abuse and neglect, uh, lack of failure to develop good bonding with uh, a, a parent or guardian uh, increases the risk uh, that a, a person will uh, show a number of things, uh, traits like depression. Mm -hmm. and, and the self-medication, I think, is a, is a very real attempt to make oneself feel better, whether it results in an, addic an addiction or just simply a dependency, but, uh, yeah. And stress as well, I, I mean, what's your feelings about, I mean, uh, I've talked about depression and anxiety, I mean, that involves stress. What's the relationship between stress, drug abuse, well, addiction? Well, uh, yeah, I think first we have to, I, I like the following definitions of stress. I think we have something we call positive stress. We know that we experience that. We take a risk, do something, and feel exhilarated by... That's what we're all suffering now. Uh, you know, well, yeah. right, hopefully. <laughs> uh, and then we have something called tolerable stress, where something bad happens, but you have the internal characteristics and the external support systems that allow you to weather the storm. And then we have something which speaks for itself called toxic stress. Mm. And toxic stress is a situation where per perhaps because one lacks the internal mechanisms of good self-esteem, and, and the external support systems from a parent or guardian or somebody, friends and so on, that they really can't handle this. And then one alternative is to turn to substances and try to bury oneself in, in that. And so I think it's toxic stress of one kind or another that is probably associated with this substance abuse. This sounds like a very sort of complex, multifaceted picture. I mean, it's very difficult to categorize in a simple sort of way. Well, I, I want to build a little bit on what Bruce said. I absolutely agree with everything he has said. We know that stress and stressors may predispose to developing substance use, abuse, and an addiction. We also know that drugs of abuse actually can change our stress threshold. So in fact, they increase stress responsivity in some very specific ways at the gene expression level, at the neurobiologic integrated level. We also know as we look at persons with addiction, although there's a very common 30 to 50% what we call comorbidity between depression and anxiety and different addictions, we know that those who use opiates, and I'm particularly concerned, Paul, about one of the stats you gave. The very latest stats from NIH show that 15%, 15% of our high school seniors, the 12th graders, have used illicit opiates at least one time. And they're primarily prescription opiates, and yes, they may be out of the medicine cabinet from grandma or from cousin, or maybe overprescribed by a dentist for themselves, or it may be purchased on the street, and it's rather chilling to think that Vicodin and Oxycontin pills on the street 
are $40, but heroin is only $5. And so you can see why there's a huge migration in almost every neighborhood over the past couple of years to heroin. But that 15% is high. The opiate addict wants to hide from stress, and opiates will suppress stress. They suppress it dramatically, and sometimes that can be good. There's a very recent paper in the New England Journal just came out showing that if soldiers in the war in Iraq are given morphine on the battlefield after they have a non-head injury, they excluded people with head injuries, it would prevent them from getting post-traumatic stress disorder in very high prevalence of cases. Whereas if they were not given morphine on the battlefield, they had a much greater likelihood. This actually builds on much earlier data showing that even when you're asleep in general anesthesia during a surgical procedure, if you receive morphine or another opiate, your stress hormones are not highly activated by the pain and stress that's being felt even though you're asleep. And you are less likely to require huge amounts of pain medication on the other <coughs> side. So those two sets of studies show the positive power. But for a teenager to go out and take Vicodin, Oxycontin, or heroin because they feel stress is not a good thing because with chronic use, you will get the tolerance, the dependence, but also about that one in three will like it and continue to use it. And peer pressure indeed plays a role at that point. Mm. So it's a way to escape from stress. Mm. And cocaine and alcohol are the opposite. They activate our axis. They make us alert, happy, disinhibited, very bright, very sharp. But on the other side of that, just on the other side of opiates, when you go into withdrawal, you have even more stress. So if a youngster says, well, I'm less stressed, I feel better with an opiate or with cocaine or alcohol, say yes, but tomorrow you'll feel worse. And they will. You, you, something else you just mentioned there was um, changes to brain function as a consequence of drug use. Um, can, are these permanent or can they be reversed? Have you anything to say about, about this? Well, I told you the good news about one day, but I'll tell you the bad news about two weeks in a rat or mouse. We have shown that whereas you can get away with reversible changes at one day, by the time you get out to two weeks of binge pattern cocaine, binge three times in a row, or binge alcohol, or regular intermittent heroin, the brain has changed. Specific receptors have changed. For instance, the mu opioid receptor changes with cocaine dependency. For instance, dopamine D1 and D2 receptors, which is part of, again, our natural pleasure, changes is pushed downward by any of these chronic drug uses. And we've shown in our rodent models where we can study this prospectively, which we certainly can't do in humans, that it takes longer to recover than it did to cause the problem. Using PET scans, positron emission tomography in rat brains in collaboration with our wonderful colleagues in uh, Japan, we've been able to show that it takes over three weeks to recover from binge cocaine yet the persistent changes were fully caused within one to two weeks. So these are very disturbing things. I will not use the word permanent, Paul, mm. but I will say slow to recovery, persistent, slow to recovery. And if we translate that, we begin to understand why two weeks or four weeks in rehab doesn't do it, and why even one year for many does not allow the brain to return to normal. Huge amounts of support but time also is required and to go Bruce, through. Bruce, yes. And, and well, add on to that. If we just, our lab studies the effects of, of repeated stress on the brain. And in, in animals <clears throat> that are quite healthy and resilient, we find that there is the actual change in the, in the circuitry in the brain. Some parts of the brain, like the amygdala, which is involved in fear, um, actually show growth in the formation of new connections and the animal becomes more anxious. But other areas that are involved in the control of that <clears throat> amygdala function like the prefrontal cortex or the hippocampus show a shrinkage of, of neurons and a decrease in connections. Um, and it changes the animal's behavior, less able to, to remember things, less able to control uh, less cognitively flexible and so on. But the good news is that if you stop the stress uh, and an animal is, is healthy and resilient, these changes reverse themselves uh, in a matter of, of a, a week or, so, or several weeks. And so one view of what the problem that we have with 
mental illness and also with perhaps the, with, uh, the drug addicted state is the brain gets locked into a state where these circuits are altered and they don't spontaneously recover. And that, as you were just saying, is one of the concerns with the addicted state is that these changes are not as readily reversible as they might be yeah. in a healthy brain. And I think Bruce's lab has shown the same thing mine has with drugs, with non-drug stressors or drugs, which indeed change stress, that the longer the insult, the more protracted may be the recovery from the brain injury. And there are many, many absolutely objective measurements, both with stress and with drug-induced changes. But further, we know that genes, Paul, may alter our response to stress. My lab, a few years ago, uh, identified a variant of the mu receptor where our endorphins act. And we found that this receptor, by studying it in molecular and cellular constructs, changes the binding of our favorite endorphin, beta endorphin, it's our longest one, and changes the signaling. But we also, in further studies, have found again in cells and in moving up to animals and humans, that when you have this change receptor, the receptor doesn't get where it needs to go on the cell surface in adequate numbers. And we know that's definitely true in cells, and we have some early evidence to suggest it may be true in the human brain, which we must study for the most part in a postmortem situation with the variant. And further, we know that with this variant, there is greater responsivity to a stressor of any kind as objectively measured. And my lab has gone on to show with our collaborators at the Karolinska in Stockholm that this variant is very strongly associated with both opiate addiction which has altered stress responsivity during withdrawal from opiates, and with co alcoholism, and we don't know about cocaine dependency, but we know alcoholism and heroin dependency are strongly associated with this stress responsive functional variant. And one in five of us have a copy. Ha. Well, there's only three of us up here. On That's the right. <laughs> we probably all three <laughs> have it. <laughs> I'm going to ask you both now a sort of raft of questions, which I think would be of particular interest to parents in the audience. Um, so you can take them. I'll go through them, then you take them as you, as you feel. So I think one question that um, parents that would be like to know something about is, can um, non-narcotic, non-stimulant prescription drugs, such as antidepressants or Ambien, be addictive? I think that's one thing people would be interested in. Is there a correlation between academic pressure and drug use? Um, and what about stimulants such as Adderall and uh, Ritalin, which are prescribed for um, a, a deficit hyperactivity disorder? What do you think about these drugs? What about their use for cognitive enhancement? Um, there's a sort of raft of things there which I think will be familiar to many in the audience. Who would like to take some of that? The general concern that I've been mulling over is uh, if, we, if we think that it's not, uh, that it's bad for and, and uh, unethical for athletes to take performance enhancers uh, for athletic uh, competitions. What about taking cognitive enhancers to do well in school, to get into the college of choice if they really indeed help? Maybe people might and need to know a bit about cognitive I mean, what, yeah. what are cognitive enhancers? Well, I mean, enhances? there are, you probably have <clears throat> a better idea of the range of these things, but do you have the uh, drugs like the uh, Ritalin, which, which is you know, used for attention deficit disorder, which in a normal person will act as a sort of mild cocaine. And you have drugs that are involved in, in keeping you awake so you can stay awake and, and study. Mm -hmm. and, and then uh, you have other drugs which are supposed to, whether they do or not, improve memory functions. It's not clear. But there's, it's a very big and growing area whether there is truth in some of the uh, claims uh, is another matter. It's so do you, just to, sorry, yeah, before, sure. just, so do you think that this should be regulated in some way? What's your sort of views about this? Well, I mean, I, I think that in the case of athletics, we know that there's mm -hmm. a huge amount of money involved, and we don't, and, and that I think the financial rewards for athletes who, you know, break the home run record and so on puts them in the public spotlight. I think that's probably not quite the case and quite so obvious for cognitive enhancement, and we all believe in, in educational attainment and helping to fulfill your potential as a human being. 
And so I don't, I don't have a, you know, I haven't formulated an opinion yet, but I think it is a dilemma in our society that we have to think about. Yeah. Well, I, I will sound like the director of uh, the NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, when asked this question. It's very controversial, Paul, as you appreciate, and some of our good friends and colleagues have different opinions. Having said that, I think what we have, Bruce and I have already said about drugs being able to change your brain, stress being able to change your brain, we really don't want extensive use of a drug that is not being used as a medication. Now, I hope everyone heard what I'm saying. If you have a child with bona fide, a well-diagnosed ADHD, they need to have a medication in many, if not most cases. Is that a diagnosis that's reached too often? I don't want to comment on that. There's controversy internationally on that. But someone with that disorder as either a child or adult may not be functional to their full extent. And Ritalin, methylphenidate, has been shown to be extremely effective. It is a miniature cocaine, but it isn't. It doesn't give the same kind of euphoria or high. It binds at the same three uptake sites, but with slightly different proportions. And what I said early on, there's now a new version of it called Concerta, which is long acting, which seems to be better in preventing any abuse or any high coming out of the medication and yet having the same excellent beneficial effect. Uh, other medications are being used for ADHD and actually strangely Adderall is one of them. And Adderall is now becoming sadly a major drug of abuse. Ritalin was for a while. Some um, 10th and 11th and 12th graders would chew their friends Ritalin that they had bona fidely for the ADHD and it is a performance enhancer, it is. Mm -hmm. They might be able to do better on an exam. That's quite scary. I don't believe you need to perform better because you're not going to have it all the time and all your life, and you'll find yourself in a college you can't really perform well in. Adderall is a mixture. Well, that's true. Adderall is a mixture of, dextra, uh, if, of uh, dexedrine. It's like the old-fashioned dexedrine and a little bit of amphetamine. Now, those drugs were very popular in the 50s and 60s. I don't think I want to see lots of children mm -hmm on them or abusing them, and that's beginning to happen. So I think we have to think of medications needed, just as we do opiates for pain, are incredibly important. Well, and, and antidepressants um, mm -hmm. are, I think, off, too often prescribed for depressions that could be treated by simply dealing with the, the, the factors that have caused it, or by simple things as physical activity, which is probably as good an antidepressant for a moderate mild to moderate depression as anything and better than the chemicals. And the problem is that these chemicals, the traditional antidepressants, will initially produce anxiety, will create some real serious problems in the people who are given it, perhaps in the thought by some um, uh, uh, physician that they will help a situation that they really have not carefully analyzed. Any, any thoughts about ambient or academic pressure to perform well from parents? Okay, the Ambien, um, we can, I think, put aside. It's not a very common drug abuse. I'm worried about Adderall, but uh, I think academic pressure per se is like almost everything else. It's like Bruce's formulation on stressors. Some of us love stress, if we're honest about it, as long as it's our own kind of variety of stress. You have three at the table here. We just adore stress. If we were put in a very quiet, tranquil environment or in a beach for all, we would go nuts. We would truly not be able to cope with it, talking about impatience, anxiety, and coping poorly. Uh, I think we have to be very careful to realize that from early babyhood up to whatever at the other end, we all are different from each other, which is fantastic, and we all find different things make us anxious or stress us. Um, I know one member of my household hates waiting in lines, just hates waiting in lines. That's a major hassle. That's true for many, many people. They don't like traffic tie-ups. Anything that's a big line, you can't do anything about it. That really bothers them and almost bothers them more than a tragedy or something they can help work to change or help people or do something good about. So I think we have to be very careful before we just lump what is stressors. Now, academic pressure, to whom? Uh, if the parent wants a child to perform well and is constantly goading them, that's probably not a good thing, and you all know that. 
You know what you need to do with your children is encourage them, positive reinforce them, don't negative reinforce them, tell them what they do that's well done. And then the other thing you need to do with children, and this is terribly important, I think, for both avoiding stress, anxiety, but also drug use, is be sure they're kept busy with something they like to do, not that you like them to do. If they really don't like doing finger exercises on the piano, find what they do like to do. And some type of sports can be fantastic in more ways than one because you get activity and we know that's good for you. And we also have time consumption beyond belief. I had a daughter who was a foil fencer many hours a week. I couldn't care the less about foil fencing, but was I ever vigilant to be sure she got to our different meets and practices and told her how terrific it was. And she's finished medical school and up at Mass General now. It, it worked well. So you have to see <laughs> what does your youngster like to do? And the same is true in academics. You don't force them in a direction where they're totally uncomfortable or to a school or college where they're totally uncomfortable. Well, it's like a, a child first learning to tie their own shoes, learning to do things for themselves, and then later developing a good sense of self-esteem and the ability to control because I think this idea of toxic stress and is a situation where you cannot control the factors around you and mm -hmm. when that happens in an overwhelming amount and you don't want to know where to turn then you're going to have not only brain but also physical problems because the whole body pays a price for this. Is there anything um, that we need to know about gender differences and susceptibility to addiction? Is there anything important there? It depends whether you're talking about humans or rats and mice. I think humans, humans. <laughs> this is the one thing that's been a real conundrum. Uh, my postdocs in row two are laughing. When we look at female little mice or little rats, they go absolutely bonkers with cocaine. They jump all over, they really can't focus at all, they don't build nests for their babies. They really have an entirely dramatic over response compared to the males, who also are certainly not normal. But when we go to humans, whether it's cocaine or opiates or alcohol, we have had real trouble, Paul, teasing out any gender differences. They're few, but they're very subtle. Mm -hmm. And they're more, excuse me, like in other fields, they are cultural. So just as we had a little bit of slowness about some good things to let females do. We had a little bit of slowness about women being exposed to drugs of abuse, which was very protective, but that protection's long gone. So we have alcohol, we have nicotine. Remember the Virginia Slims ad, you've come a long way, baby? It was playing right in to women wanting to be able to fulfill themselves in a variety of ways, professionally, socially, intellectually and with drug use. I'm going to throw it out open in a moment or two. I've got a couple more questions, so get your questions ready um, for a couple of minutes from now. I think um, guidance for parents. I've got a couple of quick questions there. Um, what is the appropriate age, in your view, to talk to children about substance abuse? What's the right stage, would you say? When my daughter came home from her independent school on 84th, she um, was in kindergarten and she had a little cartoon book and said, mommy, which is worse, cocaine or heroin? <laughs> Being in the research area that I've been in, as Paul said forever, uh, since dinosaurs roamed the world, um, I said, oh my glory, why are they telling my daughter about heroin and cocaine? But let me tell you, uh, the monitoring in the future starts looking at eighth graders. They used to start at 10. When I was on the Council of NIDA 15 years ago, I said, you better move it down. They moved it down to eight. And they have found that already by the eighth grade, 25% of children have used an illicit drug. They find by the 12th grade, 47% have used the illicit drug. They find by the eighth grade, a huge number are drinking regularly, drinking to drunkenness. By the 12th grade, 25% are binge drinking at least every two weeks. These are astonishing numbers. So I think kindergarten is the time to start. Well, this is also a, a time to you know, bring up the 
I'm working with the National Council on the Developing Child, one of the, the obvious things when you realize it is the importance of intervening and helping families and, and the early in life uh, uh, develop the right behavior, uh, support, for example, Head Start programs, mm -hmm. um, which are a, a school-type program, have only really worked well when there is a uh, a visitation by a nurse social worker to the family to help the family uh, carry out the mission, understand how their interaction with their child should go forward. And it's a learning process because if the kid goes to the school and comes home to a chaotic home, and there are a lot of chaotic homes leading to this problem, then that school mm -hmm. time is not going to benefit them. It has to be carried over. So that is an extraordinarily important, for example, Harlem Children's Zone has tried to do this in, in New York, and there are other programs that, that des we desperately need to do more of this. Paul, you didn't ask one question, which for this audience, I think is actually important to hear. Are there social economic differences? Well, not really, and that's what's a little bit surprising. The chaos may pertain both at the poorer end of the spectrum and the more affluent end of the spectrum. But when we actually analyze data for social economic brackets, the epidemiologic people that do this, the answer is not much, although it would seem that middle is a little bit protected than either extreme. If you look, however, at ethnic cultural background, there's actually one large group that's protected, and significantly so, and it's not what you're thinking. It's African Americans have actually a much lower rate of abuse and addiction to all licit drugs, alcohol, tobacco, and to all but one of the illicit drugs. Mm -hmm. So this is actually, and the data are crisp. They're from three different sets of sources and long-term studies. So maybe we're doing a better job with some groups than we are, and maybe we need more programs like the Head Start program. Again, for the parents here, what, what, what are the warning signs? What, what, what should you look out for that a ch your child is getting into trouble? It's really tough. I'm sure a lot of people in the audience have lived with teenagers. <coughs> They're always with something or another, with anger or saying no. They're we're way like two-year-olds or mature two-year-olds. There's a lot of no, but you know there. But I think if you see change, dramatic change, they're either much more sleepy, and they're always sleepy, or if they're much more angry, or if they don't want to talk to you, I would say the one paramount thing that anybody of any economic bracket should be able to offer is talking to your youngster from the time they're born. I don't know to when, it's way after they go to college. Just keep talking to them with regularity. I'm sure you do, Mary Jean, I'm oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but every day for your child who's living with you, going to school from your home, Talk to them, see what they're thinking about, and don't be afraid to talk about drugs, alcohol, tobacco. And this is a funny thing that's been brought out from time to time in discussions, but alcohol use is very common. Abuse is not common, and you don't want abuse, whether it's an adult or a child. Most adults have actually stopped smoking cigarettes. Some don't, and they're not evil. They're having a real problem with their addiction, and many groups are working on better treatments. And it has to be talk therapy combined with pharmacologic therapy, just as we have shown with opiate addiction. We have some very good medications for opiate addiction, some modest ones for alcoholism, and essentially none yet for cocaine. It must be combined with all the best of the self-help AA type groups and individualized talk therapy. I mean, it's a triad for stress, for anxiety, for depression, and for addiction. One last question from me, and then we're going to throw open to the audience. Um, should we consider activities like video games and texting <coughs> as addictive? Well, I'm not very good at it, but I consider, you, you saw me tapping my thumb, I'm not fast. Anybody over 35 isn't as fast as people under 35 in texting, right? We all know that. That's a compulsive behavior. And compulsive behaviors, clearly every addiction has some compulsive behavior as part of it. But response to stress, response to anxiety, response to depression, 
and response to drugs for abuse and addiction are not just a compulsive behavior. There are other components that are exquisitely important. There's some overlap when we get all the genes sorted out in the gene variants, we'll have some overlap with genes of each of the things I mentioned, including the compulsive behaviors. There is components in gambling, in video games, in atypical sexual behaviors, in overeating. There are crossovers with each of the things that Bruce and I have been discussing molecularly, gene expression, but it's not 100%. And closer are the ones you put together tonight are stress, anxiety, depression, and drug abuse. They are actually closer together in their pathways. So yes, but may I also say something else? Drug abuse, one of the big causes is not just stress, or maybe they're very tightly related, it is boredom. Hmm. Boredom is probably the biggest stressor out there if you stop to think about that. And if you put Bruce and Paul and myself in front of a TV set for the five hours a day that's average in many communities, we wouldn't make it. Well, and I think the phrase I like is finding a meaning and purpose in life. And people who can't often will you do some of these other things. And it's important that we help people find that meaning and purpose. Right, thank you. We're going to get now questions from your, the audience. Um, thank you very much. This is very enlightening, and uh, I'm fascinated by the question of um, genetic, predis uh, genetic or DNA um, predispositions, and if someone can be identified as having that genetic predisposition, um, and what do you do about it? Well, the more, I mean, I think one thing that we should keep in mind is that many variations on common genes, we're beginning to discover more and more of them, uh, present in our, um, in, in, in our population. We often identify them as having a link to a disease, but they probably wouldn't be there if they didn't have some adaptive advantage. Uh, and there is a, um, a wonderful piece that I'd be happy to, you know, refer people to in Atlantic Monthly, uh, called I believe it was Dandelions and Orchids, um, Orchids and Dandelions, about the other side of the story that is that these particular risk factor genes, if there is a a nurturing environment that this person is exposed to, they can often achieve more this would be the orchid type, than the dandelion who, who will survive no matter what. In fact, I think the term, this term, especially the dandelion, comes uh, the, as a Swedish expression which describes their observations that there are certain resilient types of people. But the, it's the orchid side which we often, as I said, identify as a risk for a disease but with the proper nurturing can have the opposite effect. And I, be glad to make sure people I are interested in this. I want to say two things about genetics. We know from many fine epidemiologic studies that 60 to 70 percent of the vulnerability to develop most of the major addictions, opiate, alcohol, and uh, uh, really nicotine as well, have a genetic component. Listen to that word, genetic component. It's not caused by the genes. It may enhance the vulnerability, but it has to be interactive with environmental factors, and in the case of drug abuse, drug-induced changes per se. And the same is going to be true with stress response and to certainly the disorders like depression and anxiety. Secondly, it's not one gene, one variant. It's multiple variants of multiple genes that join together to increase or decrease, that's a good side, vulnerability to develop depression, anxiety, or impulsivity and risk taking. We haven't talked a lot about that, but that can also be part and parcel. It is not unlike most of our complex disorders, and Paul will tell us, even in cancer, where we think we have the gene for breast cancer, well, we don't. We have a cascade of genes that accounts for maybe 10 or 20 percent at most. So we're learning more and more. Will it be important ultimately prevention? I certainly hope so. But we're all going to have some good variants and bad variants. And as Bruce has said, most of the variants there have some good purpose that we may or may not elucidate quickly 
as well as a bad purpose. The one I told you about in your mu receptor means you don't respond to pain as much when you have an injury. You probably do a little bit better originally or initially before a doctor can get you. So, you know, there's good and bad sides of just about every variant when we know enough. And, and the interactions between the environment and these genes is uh, ex extremely, it's the essence of what we're talking about, that you just can't so easily blame things on bad genes because there's an environmental component as well, and we have to appreciate that. Well, because genes were discovered here, that's why you got three answers to that um, <laughs> question. I think we have, um, uh, yes, here in the front row. Is it on? Just yeah. speak, yeah. Okay. Um, you had mentioned um, talk to your child or children. Um, I was wondering if you had done any studies um, in high schoolers of the difference between going to boarding school and staying home, because obviously if your children are not at home and they're at boarding school, um, you know, I just didn't know if there were studies that sort of show differences there. I mean, not so much boarding school, but talking, having talked at a uh, high school, private high school here recently about the brain and stress, the big concern of the teachers that I talked to was how their stu the students learn time management because they have so many options, whether it's playing video games or working on their homework or being drawn into athletics, social interactions. And being able to exert some sense of self-discipline and self-control because it's a very demanding life that these kids go through in order to manage, for example, an athletic program, study, and, and also maintain some kind of social life. And, and so whether you know a boarding school or a home environment provides better guidance or opportunities for that self-control, I think is the, is the real question, but it is developing that self-control that is really the key. Are there good studies of boarding school versus uh, public or independent day schools? No, I wish there were, there really aren't. Um, uh, different cultures, different times mandate different things. Be glad to talk to you at greater length after this about it. But I, I, I think one of the wonderful things here, if a child is away, and sometimes there's real need to have a child away. Sometimes parents are traveling or they're in the foreign service or whatever and you want continuity. Other times there may be not so good reasons. But probably the cell phones are a terrific thing. You can talk to your child. It used to be you couldn't talk to your child because the phone was a shared phone and turned off at eight o'clock or something like that. And now if you can put your phone on some quiet ring that the proctor doesn't hear, you probably can talk just about any time. So I, I, um, I have watched some of the single parents in my lab or the parents where for one reason or the other, one parent has to assume a greater role. And one of the great things I've seen, and I shouldn't reveal this, Paul, but you know, I know several of the patterns like, you're leaving school now? Okay, would you call me as soon as you get home? And another call, it's a very quick call, doesn't interrupt the work or anything. And yet that parent knows when the child has left the school, when they've opened the house. And it's really actually extremely interesting to watch. With my children, the, the battery was always flat. Was that not? <laughs> and I'm sure that would be true with mine too if they had been cell phone age. Questions, right. I think there's one here in the middle and then can you get back? Thank you, I enjoyed your presentations very much. Um, you talked about the different types of stress and how that can lead to anxiety, depression, um, drug and alcohol addiction. But for teens particularly, you gave different examples of stress for teens, um, <coughs> academic pressure. But for teens particularly, I would think that one of the, the main stressors or, uh, that they have is, is lack of sleep. And I was wondering if there's any data about lack of sleep and the change in circadian rhythm and how that could contribute to alcohol or drug abuse? Well, I mean, we, there are some very good studies on sleep deprivation and the entire physiology is altered. For example, your sympathetic tone is enhanced, your counterbalancing parasympathetic tone is decreased, there's more inflammatory chemicals in the blood, there's a flattened uh, rhythm of your cortisol, 
um, an increased appetite, um, uh, causing a person to eat more junk foods and comfort foods and so on, uh, which can, if it goes on, can lead to you know overconsumption and over too many calories, perhaps contribute to obesity. Um, so it's it's a major physiologic disruption to disrupt the the circadian pattern by short sleep or by irregular sleep. Um, and I think in, in our entire modern society, it's not just kids that suffer from this, it's adults, um, a, commuting, I mean, you, you name it, you can understand. I think that is a major, major contributor to, um, and, and some studies in our lab, ongoing studies, have shown that if you disrupt that circadian pattern, not only do animals become obese in, a, in, a, in a, sh a relatively short time, but they begin to become impulsive and show a, a cognitive rigidity that prevents them from being flexible in, in learning a new task. It's pretty startling and frightening to think that these things are happening to, to a lot of people, including children. And use of drugs of abuse change of sleep patterns. So. Uh, it can confound the whole situation. But I think the further studies go at the human level, the more we learn that sleep is very essential and nobody's getting enough of it. <laughs> I think there was a question in the front here. Thank you all for a wonderful presentation. My question is it, the rather alarming statistics about the youth, the, the very young ages when this stuff starts to creep in. Have they, has there been an attempt to go behind the numbers to see how often those kids have parents who are abusing? John, I would say there are not as many studies as one would like to see. But when one looks at it the other way, people who have abused drugs and their children, um, there are two sets of data that are rather frightening and they're very different from each other. One is two or three major investigators have looked at the impact of prenatal nicotine exposure on the development of nicotine addiction later, specifically nicotine to nicotine, and have found it to be significantly enhanced in children that were exposed perinatally prenatally and immediately postnatally. And these are epidemiologic studies, and in no case, sadly, did they have either genetic arms or neurochemical arms. But the formulation has been that there could be brain changes based on many studies in rodents about prenatal, perinatal, of an on-off effect as opposed to a steady state. And again, I come back to that. It is why in pain medication, in treatment of addictions, in treatment of depression, we try to go to steady state and homeostasis. Or it could be that there's just training. In other words, they saw mother or father smoke. If you look at people who've come into treatment for addiction, it's skewed. They obviously had very severe addiction. Their children tend to be better and maybe it's because they felt so militantly about the fact they had a problem and they didn't want those children to have a problem. As we have looked at children born of people in methadone maintenance treatment for heroin addiction, those children have done just outstandingly as a group and are four or five small studies. They're not huge studies. They're not satisfying from an epidemiologic standpoint. But I think of that as everything had changed to the positive in their family environment. So I don't think we have enough really good studies. Suffice it to say there is one thing that's of disturbing quality now, which is a very large number of people in the 60s use some drugs fairly frequently and maybe still do. And I'll be blunt, when we have tried to get normal healthy volunteers for our addiction studies of genetics of addiction and genetics of depression. We have found it very difficult to find in Manhattan, middle income primarily being our target group, people with no marijuana use at all. That's an interesting statement, isn't it? But it's true. And you don't see this in studies and you don't see it in newspapers. And we do know that when we look at 
high school seniors that 37% have used marijuana, well, okay. But we haven't asked, and how about your parents? We haven't taken that questionnaire home. I don't do this. This is out of University of Michigan, but I don't do epidemiology. I do molecular biology and related behavior and genetics. But it's a very interesting question, isn't it? And I have heard some people say, well, wouldn't it be hypocritical to tell a child that they shouldn't experiment since they are using? Well, probably with alcohol, but I actually draw a tough line here, and you've heard me draw that tough line before this evening. Well, there's the, the whole issue of abuse and neglect, which tends to be transmitted from, uh, that, that is, parents, be, uh, children of, parent, of an abused become themselves abusers, and this can perpetuate. And more generally, there's this whole field of epigenetics, which... Uh, which involves not just the regulation of genes, but also the modification in ways that don't change the sequence. And this has many potential to explain many tra some transgenerational effects, perhaps things like the nicotine story, perhaps things related to obesity and so on. I, I think you don't want to know much more about epigenetics, but Bruce and I are both doing a lot of epigenetics research in our laboratory, and both in a rodent model and a whole human. We see these changes that aren't DNA. So if genetics and DNA seem complex, the epigenetic story is going to be far more complex. But it is important. And the only good part, it may last, but then again, it may not last. And we may be able to manipulate it in part behaviorally or pharmacologically. So the DNA is yours. And I look upon it as something we all have some good genes and bad gene variants. And we all are going to die. That's an amazing statement. But we all are living happily. And the one message I think parents have to think about at all times is be sure your child has some happiness, has some joy. Question here at the left with the microphone. Just speak, it will oh, work. Okay. Um, when you're talking to your children about drug abuse, do you include your own experiences? Is it good to share that with them? Is it bad? <laughs> well, never having do, abused do you, drugs. Do you, <laughs> I frequently wondered if I should invite Yeah, I'm referring you. to past. I really wondered if I should invite in slightly younger parents. We had our parents, children, when we were a little bit above what was then the accepted age, not now, but you know, they, we were a little bit older. And I thought maybe we should invite somebody in because my experience was alcohol, period. That's the only, and that's, I'm allergic to cigarettes. So the first time I ever tried cigarettes, I coughed, squeezed, and choked. And then I realized I did that when other people were smoking. So I was thrilled when smoking became non-normative. But you're asking a very good question, and I think, talking to other people, the answer is probably yes. Probably yes. And I think with alcohol, you all, if you haven't been there yourself, you have observed somebody you know or love drink to drunkenness, and it's not a pretty sight, is it? So teaching a child about one drink, two drinks might be nice, but Drinking to drunkenness is not. And then, Paul, I think I have to tell about the one set of data that NIAAA has brought out in two separate huge studies. Some will ask me, well, shouldn't you teach your child to drink when they're young? Big controversy. And some will say countries that do have a lesser problem with alcoholism. Not true. Italy, France, all the European countries have just about the same rate as U.S. does. Just about the same rate. Now, I'm only going to be able to take at, at three more questions. There's a question over here to the right, and yeah, I, I'm, I'll do my best. Thank you for that statistic on, um, on marijuana use in Manhattan. But I, my, my experience, well, anecdotal to be sure, is that I've seen far more people's lives truly hurt, sometimes catastrophically, by, by nicotine and alcohol addiction, none by, by, kinica, by marijuana, or in fact any other drugs, but, but, uh, and yet you seem much more casual about, about uh, alcohol and maybe cigarettes. 
I don't think we should ever be casual about nicotine. Nicotine is um, um, with almost no redeeming feature except in two very rare disorders. You're absolutely right about alcohol, too. Alcohol is probably our biggest killer. And alcohol kills in two very different kinds of ways above and beyond dependency. One is driving while drinking. And this is why I have very strong feelings about the drinking age. And they are counter to what most people say. I believe it should be stay right at 21. And the data showing those that develop dependence is much greater if you start younger, too. 25% um, of people that are ever going to become dependent uh, ha are dependent by the time they're about 16 or 18, and that's fairly scary. Um, I think marijuana we should be very careful about. Intermittent casual use, just like a glass of wine for the majority of people, or two glasses of wine for the majority of people, does not cause a problem, apparently. But on the other hand, marijuana may lead to addiction. It can lead to a driving while under the influence that has very similar effects to alcohol. It could lead to decreased cognitive functioning. And we don't know enough. So I think one thing that I have said, and I'm deeply concerned about the overuse of, quote, medicinal marijuana, yet I support the appropriate medicinal use of marijuana. We have endocannabinoids in us, just like we have endorphins in us. Endocannabinoids bind to our cannabinoid receptors, or two types of those. So we know it's a normal substance, just like the endorphins are normal substances. But we have to be very careful about exaggerating the amount of any chemical, being it steroids for steroid performance enhancing, or cannabinoids, be it marijuana on top of the endocannabinoids, or opiates when we don't have pain on top of the opioid system. Now, I think we have one question there, and then I'm going to take one more after that. So, so there. Thank you. Could you talk a little bit more about what we know about binge drinking in, in ninth, tenth graders, young high school kids, and, late, and brain development and brain function and later function, as I think we're hearing a lot about it and seeing it? Well, I personally find, and I'm sure you all did, when I said that 25% uh, of high school seniors are binge drinking, defined by monitoring the future as more than five drinks in a row. More than five drinks in a row, like an evening or part of an evening, at least every two weeks. Um, that same study and a study from SAMHSA, which is another major, separate major federal agency, and the CDC, which is the third group that performs such studies, and then Robert Wood Johnson that does so on a private basis, and um, they have all shown that um, around 40% of college students may binge drink. Same definition, more than five drinks. Five drinks or more in a row in one setting. That has increased when we were, quote, young. We had some episodes of drinking more than we drink now, but that has increased. This is much higher, and one thing you have to remember and you've seen it in the workplace, and some of you are quite young, and you've seen it yourselves. We used to have a one-day weekend. It was Saturday. Then we developed a two-day weekend, Friday and Saturday. And now colleges almost all have a three-day weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And of course, we throw Sunday in as a recovery day, maybe. And it's very important to think about that. And if you walk up on First Avenue, you'll see Thursday night a lot of persons in their 20s and early 30s going in and out of bars. And then we see casual Friday and put it all together. We have a creeping problem with the binge drinking. It does begin as the binge drinking pattern as early as the eighth grade and counsel to parents uh, watch for parties on Fridays and Saturdays. Be sure somebody that you trust of an adult type, you trust of an adult type, 
is in that household the entire time and monitoring, not facilitating, the event. I'm going to finish the final question there. Yep. Uh, you, 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 mentioned early, you mentioned earlier about uh, the use of uh, Adderall and, um, and uh, performance enhancing uh, drugs. And the question is, do, do those drugs result in negative physical changes to the brain the way, for example, excessive cocaine use, I believe, uh, creates actually negative physical changes. The data are not all in. We do know, and there have been enough studies now using positron emission tomography in humans to show that with, for instance, ADHD, uh, the attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, the brain may be benefited by methylphenidate and possibly more by steady state methylphenidate than a rapid onset, rapid offset. Adderall is just a mixture of amphetamine and dexedrine. And studies, there are enough studies at the bench showing that chronic use of those will cause brain changes. And those are not good brain changes. They, those two compounds actually cause neurotransmitter release in addition to flooding the brain because of blocking the, what we call the reuptake, which is what methylphenidate does and what cocaine does. Um, we talked about performance enhancing, and there is one kind of performance enhancing we didn't talk about, and we probably shouldn't talk about, but it's pilots in the military. And pilots in the military are very carefully monitored but they are kept awake. And from what we know about circadian disruption, these drugs don't necessarily overcome the, the cognitive impairments that, that are beginning to emerge. In a moment, I'm going to thank Mary Jean and Bruce, but before I do that, I want to invite you all to our next Parents and Science program. I'd like you to note it. Uh, Tuesday, April 27th, the evening. There's details in the, in the back of, um, of, of your booklet. And it'll be a parent's guide to boys and girls, how hormones shape the brain and influence behavior. I uh, would like to invite you all to a reception in the Abbey Lounge. That's out there to the left, and we hope to see you again soon. I can guarantee there will be no questionnaires on the way out to monitor what you've done in your past. And I'd like to thank very much Mary Jean and Bruce for a wonderful discussion. Thank you.